Good morning, church. <clears throat> this morning, we'll be reading 1 Thessalonians 5. <clears throat> now, concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in the darkness, brothers, <clears throat> for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are, are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another, and build one another up, just as you are doing. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is the word of our Lord. It was the spring of 1988, and I was in my last semester of college. I can see some of you trying to do the math. He's, wait, he's how old? I, that can't be right. It can't be that old. Yes, 1988, spring. Last semester in college, and a pamphlet started to circulate amongst the Christian community, and it was radical. The name of the pamphlet, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988, by Edgar Wisnant, who was a former NASA engineer that had turned into a self-proclaimed prophecy expert. And at my Christian college and many other Christian colleges across the country and many churches across the country, this became a big topic of conversation. Uh, I had professors that were quick to point out many of the issues within the pamphlet, while others were decrying that this is exactly what God has told us in His Word. According to Edgar Wisnant, uh, Jesus was going to come and rapture His church sometime between September 11th and 13th of 1988 during Rosh Hashanah. Spoiler alert, it did not happen. <laughs> Edgar went on to make similar predictions in 1993 and 1994, and then he kind of slipped into obscurity until his death when he went home to Jesus in 2000. One. Now, you can imagine how people reacted to this pamphlet. Many people uh, predicted that they were going to be ready, so they quit their jobs and sold their homes and went to some isolated place just waiting. Uh, 
Church attendance did rise during the summer of 1988. A lot of people became curious. Four and a half million copies of this pamphlet were sold. 300,000 were sent free of charge, paid by Edgar himself to pastors around the country, hoping they would infuse it into their weekly conversations. The next year, 1989, another pamphlet started to circulate. 89 reasons why Jesus would return in 1989. It was not written by Edgar, by a a bunch of uh, seminary students who were maybe poking fun a little bit, but also just trying to show how maybe this isn't the way we should go about spending our time. And many of the statements in that pamphlet were in response to Edgar's statements the year before, but the best one by far was the 89th reason. Reason number 89, why Jesus would return in 1989, because He didn't come back in 1988. (laughs) Now, uh, eschatology, which is the big fancy word we use in Christian circles for the study of the end times, it literally means the study of last things. Uh, This is a very fascinating part of Christian theology. It's also very misunderstood and is often used by certain people Uh, in misappropriate ways. And yet, all of us, if you're a Jesus follower and you're here this morning, you're watching online, or even if you're still curious about following Jesus, how the world is going to end and when is Jesus going to come, of course, we're naturally intrigued by this. It'd be weird if you weren't intrigued by this. And it's natural to wonder about how and when the end times are going to occur. And fortunately, we have this last chapter in Paul's first letter to the Thessalonian church, because in this last chapter, he's going to bring some clarity to this question. And as we've entitled it this morning, we believe that Paul brings some light and how we're supposed to live in light of Christ's return. We set it up this way for you. If you grabbed a bulletin on your way in this morning, or you can grab one online. If you can look on YouTube, you can go down a little ways, and there's a place you can see the bulletin. Uh, And if you have your Bibles also, that'll be helpful today. We set it up this way for us this morning. Give us a a direction of where we're going to go. Uh, Paul concludes his first letter to the Thessalonian believers with a reminder, and then a challenge, and then finally a prayer about how the future hope that they have in Jesus. They have this future hope. And so the question we want to try to answer this morning is how are Jesus followers, whether the Thessalonian followers 2,000 years ago or those of us living today, how are Jesus followers to live in what I'm calling in the meantime, in the meantime, between, for the Thessalonians, suffering in this life. We've talked the last few weeks about how much they were enduring suffering and persecution just for following Jesus. So, what do they do between that moment and the moment when ultimate victory will take place in eternity? Uh, I'm a visual learner, maybe you are too, and so sometimes things that I can see help me understand this, so I created a little chart for us this morning. Alexi, you can put that up there. All right, this is a timeline of time. It has an arrow at the end because time, we believe, goes on forever. Uh, One pastor I follow, he likes to say, everyone lives forever somewhere. Hopefully you choose the right somewhere to live forever, but everyone lives forever. Okay, so this is the timeline of life. Next slide. You are here, somewhere. I tried to be nice and put us really close to the beginning. Uh, We don't know for sure where we are on the timeline, but you are here. We know that for certain, that you are here. Here's something else we know for certain. Christ has promised that He's going to return. Here's the issue, and it really frustrates us as Americans because we love to know all the details about everything all the time. How much is the gap between you are here and the return of Jesus? And we don't know. We could be really, really close. We could be really far away. But the question remains, what do we do? Next one, Alexia. What do we do with the big gap here? Like, this is the question. How do we live from you are here to the return of Jesus? And that could be five minutes, which would be great because then I don't have to give the rest of this to you. No, I want to. 
Or it could be who knows how many years and years and years away. What we want to try to figure out this morning is what do we do with that in-between time? How are we to live in between you are here and the return of Jesus? Uh, in case you're joining us for the first time, uh, welcome. Or if you've been in and out the last few weeks, let me give you a quick little summary of this letter we've been walking through and we complete, we complete today. Uh, Paul visited the Macedonian city of Thessalonica during his second missionary journey. And on that journey, uh, he went to the synagogue and did some preaching and teaching. He only lasted in Thessalonica about a month, we believe, uh, based upon the way that Luke details the events in Acts chapter 17. And then Paul and his group had to flee town to uh, rescue their lives. And so this young, brand new, very, very raw church starts immediately under persecution. And Paul has now traveled several hundred miles away into Corinth, and he's worried about this brand new group of Christians. So he sends Timothy back to check on them. Timothy spends some time and then returns and gives the report to Paul that they are thriving. You'd be surprised how well they're doing. And yet they have some questions and some things that they'd like some clarity on. And that's what we've seen throughout this letter. Paul loves these people. He cherishes them. He affirms them. And here in these last couple chapters, we see he's giving them some answers to questions they had, specifically questions about the end times. And we saw a few weeks ago when we kicked off this letter that the third verse of the first chapter is in many ways a blueprint or a strategy that Paul uses throughout the entire letter. Uh, love this prayer that he prays at the beginning of the letter to the Thessalonians, and he says, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, which really was the focus of chapter 1, and your labor of love. Paul talked about the love he had for them, the love they had for one another in chapters 2 and 3. And then finally, he prays about their steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, which has been the focus of these last two chapters. And uh, just a quick reminder, probably most of us know this, that the, the chapter and verses that we see in uh, our Bibles, those weren't there originally. Paul was not writing this letter and he paused and said, chapter 5, verse 1, and then continued writing. It's a letter, it's an email, it's correspondence. It flowed completely through. We added not those of us in the room, obviously, but Christians added it several hundreds of years later to help us find our way through the letters. So you really should think of chapters 4 and 5 as one long, massive chunk of text that Paul is not thinking, I'm going to break anywhere in the middle. And so as we jump into chapter 5, you'll notice that he's picking up right where he left off at the end of chapter 4. And we'll point that out here in a few minutes. One last thing, and then we'll jump into the text that Jessica read for us a few minutes ago. Uh, this whole chapter, much like chapter 4, deals with the concept of hope, the idea of hope. And we want to make sure we understand how is hope described and defined by the biblical authors, because it's a little different than how you and I maybe think and use hope in our modern culture. So, what is hope really? What is it really? First of all, Let's make sure that we don't think of hope the way many in our culture think of it, and they just use hope as a synonym for wishful thinking. Like, I really hope this happens, but I don't really know for sure. It's, it's a wish, it's a want, it's a desire, but you don't really know for sure. I hope my team wins. I hope this person says yes to me when I ask them to marry me. That's right, guys, that's like huge hope. It's like, you're really wishful. You're like, I, I could see why she'd say no. Uh, <laughs> but I know me, and I would say no to me. Uh, but that's not the hope that we see in the Bible. That's not how hope is described by biblical authors. In the Scriptures, hope really is more synonymous with trust and confidence. Uh, in fact, we're going to put it this way if, you, if you're taking notes or if you want to look at your bulletin. Um, here's how biblical hope is defined uh, by some people, and I really like this definition that I'd share it with you. For thinking of hope as being trust and confidence, it, it's like this. Biblical hope is the confident anticipation and expectation. So we're anticipating something, but we also expect it to happen. It's not completely 
out of the realm of reality, we are pretty confident. In fact, we're almost 100% confident it's going to happen. We anticipate it. We can't wait for it. But we're pretty confident it's going to happen. And this anticipation and expectation we have is something that we believe is guaranteed and certain. Guaranteed and certain. It's more like trust and confidence and less like wishful thinking. Now, that can be debated by some people. Many who do not follow Jesus or look negatively toward Christianity would say, ah, you're still kind of hoping for something that probably isn't going to happen. And yet, we believe on what Jesus said and what was written about Him, that when Jesus promised He would return, He never lied. He was completely honest in everything He said. He fulfilled everything He said He was going to do. So, a future coming of Jesus, we believe, is 100% certain. And we don't just anticipate it, we also expect it. And so, using that as our definition of hope, and really that's how Paul describes hope in these two chapters. Uh, let's jump into chapter 5 and look at the three sections that Paul describes to us about this idea of hope and how can we live in light of Jesus' return. In the first 11 verses, this section here really is continuing off of the last section from chapter 4. And Paul is trying to help the Thessalonians remember, hey, you have a reason for the hope that you possess. There's a solid reason why you hope for the return of Jesus. And Paul wants to offer confirmation to the Thessalonians that one day, Jesus is going to return as king, and He's going to confront all the suffering and all the injustice and all the death that they have experienced as a group, and every group has experienced since then. Now, one quick reminder, whenever you read these New Testament letters, remind yourself that it, you're, it's like you're reading somebody else's mail. We're only getting one half of the conversation. And so, in many ways, we have to try to uh, extrapolate out from what Paul writes what might have been the Thessalonians thinking and asking that would cause Paul to answer the way he does. And if you're with us last week, you might have noticed that at the end of chapter 4, Paul finally addresses one of the questions of the Thessalonian church, and that is, what happens to our, our loved ones when they die? These people who follow Jesus, love Jesus, and they die but Christ hasn't returned yet, so what happens to them? And Paul gave them some reassurance that it's good, they'll be with Jesus just like you'll be with Jesus someday. In fact, he ends chapter 4 with encourage one another with these words. So chapter 5, he continues, and he's still talking about end times, he's still in the eschatology world, and he's going to move on to a slightly different topic, but we can get a hint right away, everyone, that they already know a little bit about this topic. They were kind of in the dark about the end of chapter 4, but they seem to know what's going on in chapter 5. Look at those first couple of verses again with me. Paul starts it this way, now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, notice, you have no need to have anything written to you. And Paul's going to write this to them anyway, but he's quick to point out, guys already kind of know about this. This is something that isn't new. This topic is already understood to some extent. Maybe they need a refresher course, but it's not new to them. Verse 2, for you yourselves are fully aware. Paul is quick to point out that this is a topic that they have some knowledge of, but maybe they need a little more help in fleshing out the details. I also find it interesting that, that Paul in this section is really going to borrow a lot of phrases from some of the things that Jesus said, specifically in Matthew 24 some of his eschatology teachings from the Gospels. That first phrase itself, now concerning the times and seasons. Paul's riffing right off of the last thing that we have recorded that Jesus said to his disciples. In Acts chapter 1, as Jesus is with his followers and he's about to ascend back into heaven, they ask him the question, so Jesus, seems like you've conquered death, pretty great, took care of the resurrection, crucified, died for our sins, when are you going to set up your kingdom? When does all of this begin? And Jesus' response in Acts 1-7 is this. He said to them, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons that the Father has fixed by His own authority. 
So when Paul, right off the bat in verse 1, says, hey, now about these times and seasons, it's a hyperlink back to what Jesus said in Acts chapter 1. Paul will go on to say that this thing that he's about to discuss is going to come like a thief in the night. That's right out of Matthew 24. And it'll be like the beginning of birth pangs. It will start out, but then it'll increase. Also Matthew 24. So Paul isn't making this information up. He's pulling from Jesus and adding some detail to it. And he's specifically going to talk about a situation or an event that is coming in the future that in the biblical world was referred to as the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. And it seems that in light of present anxiety that the Thessalonians were feeling and sensing, that maybe they knew a little bit about the day of the Lord, but they had forgotten or they were confused. And so Paul's going to shed some light on this a little bit more. Uh, can you relate to that? I can relate to that. I have found myself at times when I am feeling weighed down by life struggles. I don't know if I've really ever experienced persecution like the Thessalonians have. But you know when life just is really bombarding you, isn't it easy to forget the things that you know for certain? Doesn't your brain kind of take a little mini vacation while you are under the depths of life and you don't remember your training very well? I think that's what's happening here. Paul very gently says, you guys know about this. We actually talked about this, or you've learned this already, but let me remind you of some things about the day of the Lord. So if you're not familiar with this, uh, the day of the Lord is mentioned multiple times in the Old Testament. As many as eight different Old Testament prophets talk about the day of the Lord. And it doesn't seem to be a singular day. In this instance, day probably means a period of time. Paul mentions it here. Peter mentions it in his second letter as well. The day of the Lord describes a period of time. We don't know how long it will be, but it's a period of time when God intervenes in the events of earth. And it often accomplishes two things. It accomplishes judgment to those who are opposed to Him and redemption for those who are with Him. The day of the Lord has a future sense to it, but also there have been these little, what I call, mini days of the Lord throughout Scripture, places where God stepped in and said, all right, we're going we're gonna to kind of recalibrate here, and the evil that is rising is going to be dealt with pretty severely. And those that are of God will be redeemed and restored. But not to the extent that we see in the future. You just walk through your Old Testament. I, many would say that the flood in Noah's day, that was a mini day of the Lord. God kind of reset the world and rescued Noah and his family. Moses and the Israelites escaping Egypt and getting to the other side of the Red Sea and watching the Red Sea collapse on Pharaoh and his soldiers. It's like a little mini day of the Lord. In fact, any time an empire would rise and oppose God and fall, those are like little mini days of the Lord, but the big kahuna day of the Lord is still to come because in the future sense and how most biblical authors talk about the day of the Lord is that at one point in time, God is going to once and for all take all those civilizations and rulers and empires that have opposed Him. And He's going to do away with them, and He's going to promote justice. And those who have exalted themselves, even to call themselves divine, God is going to judge and remove. And those who follow God and are called His people will be redeemed and restored. That final day is still on the horizon, and Paul wants to remind them that that day has not happened yet because we're still here. It's coming. And Paul uses a lot of metaphors to help highlight, highlight this. He talks about those who are of Christ are in the day, those who are not are in the night, in the dark. We're awake, they're asleep. We're sober, they're drunk. He also pokes a little fun at uh, the Roman Empire. This is kind of a fun little thing. In verse 3, you'll notice Paul says this, while people are saying, quote, there is peace and security, but sudden destruction will come upon them very quickly. 
This phrase, uh, peace and security, was part of Roman propaganda in the first century. You're probably aware of how the Roman Empire operates. According to recent uh, social media trends, men think about this all the time. But according to the Roman Empire, they would come in and by force overtake a people group, soldiers everywhere, and they said, now you have peace and security. Peace and security brought about by force and manipulation and extortion. And Paul, bar borrows, Paul borrows that piece of propaganda and says, you know, everyone around you is saying, you have peace and security, and they have no idea what's coming someday for them. The real peace and security comes for those who are of God and will work through the day of the Lord and be on the other side with Him forever. Now, the key to this whole section, much like the end of chapter 4, the key to this section in chapter 5, there are the first 11 verses, is verse 11, where Paul says, therefore, encourage one another, build one another up, just as you're doing. All of Paul's eschatology talk is meant to encourage. It's to give hope to the grieving and the persecuted. Paul's eschatology talk, you'll notice, does not try to satisfy curiosity. He doesn't get lost in specifics. He doesn't try to pinpoint. He doesn't try to come up with five reasons why Jesus will be coming back according to chapter 5 or something like that. The specifics are nowhere to be found. Paul's focus is, this is an event that is in the future, that's about all we know, have assurance, have trust, have hope. And we've seen over the years that when individuals or groups become preoccupied with end times, it's a great curiosity, it's fun to study, interesting to talk about and read about. But sometimes people can go too far and they become preoccupied with end times. And when that happens, when it becomes more of not a fascination, but a fixation and an obsession, well, you tend to see three things. Oftentimes, that, that causes fear, and not a healthy fear like a respect of what God's going to do someday, but it creates out-and-out -out panic and fear, and people will do crazy things when they go down the wormhole. Most often, a hyper-focus on the end times creates pride. I know something you don't know. I've picked a date. And I always think, if I ever were to fall that victim to that and I was going to pick a date, I'd pick one so far in advance that I wouldn't be around when I was wrong, <laughs> you know? 2165, mark it down, everybody, 2165. There's some pride there sometimes where people feel like I have knowledge that you don't have and I've figured this all out, and yet I go back to what Jesus said in Acts 1-7, you're not to know the times and the seasons. The Father's fixed it, but it's just not that important. The details are not necessary. The third thing that this often does is it creates division. Well, I have this view on my eschatology. Well, I have this view. Well, you must be wrong. I don't even know if you're a Christian anymore. And suddenly we're divided over things that we don't really know anything about. Maybe we should focus on the things that we can know for sure. And so Paul's application in this whole section is not, hey, let's figure it all out. It's stay awake, be confident, live righteously. So we put it this way in your notes. If you're a hope-filled Jesus follower, which I hope in the biblical sense you are, if you're a hope-filled Jesus follower, then you focus on the assurance of Christ's return. more than the timing of Christ's return. That we rally around one another and really emphasize, we know Jesus has promised this. We know this is going to happen. The timing can sometimes be a little bit of a sidetrack that gets us off our main focus. It's great to talk about, read about, think about. I'm not telling you to abandon eschatology, but let's keep it in perspective and let's keep it balanced. And let's focus on the assurance we have and the confidence we can have and the hope that we can have and let that be our rally cry and not get lost too much in the details. I think living in preparation for Jesus' return is far better than just trying to know the timing of Jesus' return. 
And so Paul has given them some really good information on how they know, how they can be secure in knowing that they have this hope. He then moves into the next section and focuses on how the Thessalonians can now live out this hope. This is the section where Paul offers 14 statements, very rapid fire, that demonstrate what a Jesus community should look like. I like to look at verses 12 through 22, and I think of this as, this is what it would be like if Paul had Twitter. And like original Twitter when you can only do 140 characters. I mean, if you have a Bible in front of you, whether it's, uh, you know, on a device or you have a hard copy in front of you, some of these verses are the verses that when you're a kid, you say, yes, I'd like to memorize that verse, please. Uh, I'll gladly memorize verse 16, rejoice always, boom, done. You're always looking for the shortest verses. I don't know if some of you grew up in Sunday school, church, Christian schools, but man, Jesus wept was always number one on the list of verses you wanted to memorize. Uh, And so, these short little statements these practical pieces of wisdom that focus on how we're supposed to live in the meantime, based upon what Paul just said, day of the Lord is a thing, it's not here yet, you're secured from it, you're safe from it, how are we supposed to live? What do we do in the meantime? If verses, if verses 1 through 11 was right believing, this next section is right living. This is what Jesus' followers should look like. Now, real quick, just Make sure we're on the same page here. Um, This is not a list of do's and don'ts. Don't make this a list. Please don't go home and make a list with little boxes that you check off. I prayed today. I rejoiced today. It's not a list of do's and don'ts. It's not godly habit stacking. It's not a Christian life hack. It's a lifestyle. It's when I know for sure that my eternity is set and Jesus is going to come someday, and my hope is constant in that, I can get about the business of living rightly in my community. And so all of these statements are countercultural to how the Roman culture was living. They're clear indication to outsiders that this is a different kind of community, that Jesus promoted an upside-down kingdom. And so we'll walk through these somewhat quickly. They're, they're fairly obvious, aren't they? I mean, they're obvious to understand. They're difficult to accomplish, as we'll see in a few minutes. But looking through these, Paul does a really cool thing here. Uh, He sets this up by working through life. He first talks about, here's how we should live upward toward those who have authority and leadership over us. Next, he attacks, how do we live outward to the people in our community? And then finally, how do we live inward? How are we supposed to live within my heart, within my soul? So, real quick, let's walk through these and just make a couple comments along the way. Verses 12 and 13, Paul focuses on the Thessalonians respecting or appreciating those who labor among you. He's probably referring to the elders and teachers within the church. They're the ones bearing the brunt of the persecution. They're putting more on the line. And Paul just reminds them, you know, in the Roman culture, no one enjoyed or appreciated anyone in authority. They hated them all because of the oppression that they created. I was like, hey, remember, those who are leading your church, love them, appreciate them, look out for them. Verse 13, he turns to what it's like to live out. He says in verse 13, be at peace among yourselves. You know, there's a big difference between being a peacemaker and being a peacekeeper. Peacekeepers were the Roman soldiers who kept the peace by any means necessary. Paul's pushing for peacemaking. You step into the conflict of people. You don't avoid the conflict or remove the conflict by force. You step into the middle of the mess, and you look to make peace among people. Very, very countercultural. Verse 14, three different groups of people mentioned. Admonish the idle, that would be the unruly or the undisciplined. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. I love how Paul recognizes that different people have different needs, and we're to act accordingly. If someone's unruly, undisciplined in the church, hey, they maybe need a little more admonishment. Someone who's hurting and has been weakened by society, or or they're, they're feeling the brunt of life, they don't need to be admonished, they need to be encouraged, they need to be helped. 
I, I think of all those years that uh, I was a, a math and Bible teacher at Northwest Christian School and then coached a little basketball on the side and, and just even raising my own two kids. When you're dealing with people, there isn't a one-size-fits-all. I had students that some of them just needed a gentle pat on the back. You're okay. You can do this. Other students needed the proverbial metaphorical but not actual kick in the seat. <laughs> a little more, you know, uh, times of coaching, you know, some players, you just you wanted to get in their face and be very direct with them, and that fired them up. Others, it was just constant encouragement. It's okay, little sunflower. You'll be all right. Go get them. You can do it. You can do it. And even with our own two children, they're so vastly different because God made them unique. And I look at this verse in verse 14, I think, yeah, sometimes people are idle and they need a little admonishment, but also sometimes their people are hurting and weak and they need support and encouragement. And Paul finishes it by saying, and be patient with everyone. Uh, Matt Trussell, our executive pastor, mentioned earlier this week that isn't it interesting that when Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 begins to define love, that's the first thing he mentions. Love is patient. And after Easter, we're starting a series on the fruit of the Spirit, so we'll be hitting patience a little more uh, in the months to come. But again, what a tall order. Uh, verse 15, don't repay evil for evil. Seek to do good to one another. That'd be the Jesus followers and everyone else, even those who are persecuting them. Uh, Jesus provided a new way for us to deal with people who are wronging us, and that is to repay evil with goodness. None of these are easy, but Paul's like, this is the way a Jesus follower who has hope should live. And then finally, verses 16 through 22, these are the real rapid-fire ones. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, don't quench the Spirit, don't despise prophecies, test everything, abstain from every form of evil. What's the inner response to external circumstances? Well, it seems like Paul is saying, hey, have joy no matter what. Find joy within you. Keep praying no matter what. Be thankful no matter what. Be discerning no matter what. And the discerning one's going to come back in the next few weeks as we jump into the second letter. You'll see the Thessalonians struggle with discernment. They believe a lot of foolish things. That's probably why Paul tells them to, hey, test everything. Abstain from every form of evil. So, here's one way to think about this. Hope-filled Jesus followers, they focus on right living as much as they focus on right believing. We focus on right living as much as we focus on right believing. And that whole section that is just, what a tall order to ask of us. And yet, when our hope is fixed on Jesus and we know certain of His return, it's easier to focus on, let's live this way now and not be distracted by the other things that may come along. And then finally, Paul gives us the source of this hope, just to remind us that those, those statements that he just made in 12 through 22, that those aren't necessarily accomplished by us on our own strength. Paul actually offers three prayers in this letter. The first prayer is at the beginning. Uh, where he focuses on thanking God because the Thessalonians seem to have faith, hope, and love. We talked about that a few weeks ago. In chapter 3, at the end of that section, he offers another prayer where he says, hey, God, will you please increase the love, the holiness, and the hope that these Thessalonians have? And then at the end of the letter, in chapter 5, verses 23 and 24, may God keep you holy as you await the arrival of Jesus. Notice, Paul doesn't pray that the Thessalonians have grit and resolve, and they just, you know, just pull up by their bootstraps and, and go after that list he just gave them. No, he says, yeah, actually, God, would you permeate their lives with holiness? God, would you do the work that only you can do in these people? The transformation is done by God, not us. Our call is the role we play is to be faithful and to submit and to surrender and let God do a work within us so that we begin to accomplish some of those things, some of those things that he just discussed in the middle part of the book. Hope-filled Jesus followers focus on yielding, yielding to God. We want to be a group of people that 
follow the things that Paul just mentioned, that are living correctly towards those in leadership, living correctly to those in our community, living correctly within our hearts, if we want that to happen, we have to yield to God so that He can do the work that leads to sanctification, which is the big Bible word for holiness. So we have a reason to hope. We have assurance of Jesus' return. And as a result of that hope, we have the opportunity to live out the hope by being and following in the way of Jesus. But we can't do it on our own because the source of our hope is the sanctifying work of God. Let's revisit our timeline one more time. This section here in the middle, this between the you are here and the return of Jesus, we now have an answer. Here's the answer, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 22. That's what that middle section is all about. That and other places in the New Testament especially where we're given very detailed instructions on here is how you should live based upon what you know. What do I do with the in-between time, the you are here and the return of Jesus? I dive into living the way Jesus has asked me to live. And I don't worry about the timing. That's set. It's good. We know what's going to happen. And so a question that's been bouncing around in my mind a lot as I've been looking through this book and this chapter specifically is this question here. How does my life reflect hope in Jesus? How does your life reflect hope in Jesus? Our world is suffering from a catastrophic sense of hopelessness. And as Jesus followers, I want to offer them hope, not fear, not anger, not division. We have the most hope-filled message that anyone could have, that there's a Jesus who loves you, who died for you, who rose for you to conquer sin and death, and He's coming for us one day. And that's the hope that we promote to the world. How does my life reflect hope in Jesus? What a great question to go into this week with. Let's pray together. Father, such wonderful words from Paul so hard-hitting, so convicting, and yet so loving. I thank You that He followed Your call and traveled the first century world presenting the good news of You, Jesus, and I'm thankful for those Thessalonian Christians, those early believers who had very little to go on and yet stuck to it and followed You faithfully and lived in a way that caused people to notice You, Jesus. They're our legacy. Uh, we're, we're here because of people like them. And God, I'm so thankful that I can have hope in you, real, true, honest trust and confidence and hope uh, that I'm not just banking on wishful thinking and it's a maybe, but, but you've promised it, Jesus, and our faith is in you because of the hope we have in you. And help us to live hope-filled lives this week. Uh, we love you so much. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Uh, it's so great to have you with us this morning. If you would like someone to pray with you or if you have questions, I'll be up here after service along with some of our leaders. I hope that you will have a hope-filled week. See you next time. Thank you.